Okay, so, so welcome everybody to, to this uh, round table on COVID. I must say we are not trying to be original here. Uh, in the last financial crisis, everybody accused economists of uh, working on, uh, in, uh, on irrelevant topics and not paying attention to financial crisis. Here it's amazing to notice that as soon as the crisis burst out, a large number of economists jumped on the uh, on the theme, new journals were established, new conference series, uh, everything in a couple of days. Uh, I'm even uh, scared that if you don't work on COVID, you will have trouble being, being published and being accepted to conferences. So maybe it's the other extreme. However, you know, it's, uh, 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 it's a very relevant topic for this uh, SCORE PSE partnership. And um, it's probably too early to take stock, but given that it's probably the most important macro event and insurance event of the last uh, 50 years, um, we, we've got to, to talk about, about these issues and do our best to, uh, to have an enlightened uh, position about what's going to happen. So my, my first question, which is the obvious macro question, is the following. We have obviously a recession. I heard that the projections for French GDP was minus 20%. So at last, we are going to join the club of middle income countries. Um, and um, in, my, uh, in my impression, it's treated like any other recession. Let's, let's print money. Let's have uh, unemployment benefits, um, and it's all going to be fine. Okay, so, so in your view, you know, how bad is the recession created by this lockdown? And in particular, can we expect a rapid recovery, like a standard business cycle recovery, or even more rapid than this by just restarting operations as before? Or do we expect exceptionally long-lasting uh, negative effects <laughs> on output and employment. So um, I like your views about that, and uh, I would like Jesus to talk first um, about this topic. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my, my view about this can be a structure in two parts. Part one is about data. I think this is going to be one of those situations where what we tell undergraduate students that GDP and welfare are very different uh, concepts is going to be really very striking in the sense that how much of a crisis we measure is going to depend a lot on uh, conventions, accounting conventions that may not make a lot of sense. So let me give you a very simple example. In uh, if you look at the added value that the University of Pennsylvania, my own university, is contributing to US GDP, the income of the university is roughly the same because we are still charging tuition to students. In fact, intermediate consumption is lower because we are using less electricity and less other services. So added value as measured by Penn is going up. And yet, the quality of the service that we are providing, which is online, has gone down substantially. So you're really in a situation where what GDP tells you and what welfare tells you can diverge a little bit. Having said that, I tend to fall on the side of those who are cautiously optimistic that the recovery can be relatively fast. And on that, I tend to build on the experience of world wars. Uh, and after large wars, unless countries undertook very counterproductive economic policies, the recovery tended to be fast. Why? Because basically right now, we have a lot of people that cannot work, cannot produce, but as soon as the restrictions and the lockdowns are lifted, they can go back to produce, they can come back to generate output, and there is going to be relatively uh, few barriers for that to happen. And I think in particular, even if there are going to be a few sectors like tourism and services where some social distancing will need to keep because for a while, this is not going to be uh, a, terrible, a terrible deal. Having said that, of course, there is still the uncertainty about the clinical development of the virus, 
and uh, the uncertainty about the policies that governments are going to take to handle the situation, which can actually aggravate it. But with all these three uh, caveats, one, welfare versus GDP, two, the clinical uncertainty about the, the virus, and three, the policies uh, of the governments, um, the weight of the evidence in my side tends to be a little bit towards a relatively fast recovery. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Anybody wants to qualify that, disagree? Could I actually uh, ask a quick follow-up question or sort of a, a make a remark, which is, it seemed to me that when people talk about GDP, GDP drops or growth rate declines, uh, people talk about very different numbers. For example, the uh, professional forecasts I've seen, remember seeing back in March, uh, from sort of professional forecasters or you know, teams of economists at banks, seem to be actually quite optimistic and in particular i i remember looking at them and they seem to say sort of gp uh, decline drops by 25 or 30 percent but at an annualized growth rate so you know what that really means right is that what you have to do is you have to sort of divide by four so yeah. if you look at true gdp growth and you know it says it, it's minus 25 or 30 percent Right, that really says, you know, if you look, if, if GDP were to grow at the same growth rate over the next three quarters, also it would decline by 30 percent. So, uh, so then you only get numbers like sort of six or, or six, seven and a half percent. So, I guess the question for Gilles was is the, the French number you said was that also sort of at an annualized growth rate, uh, or, or was that actually the drop in the quarter, uh, in, in Q2, say? Do you know it's, it's an annualized projection, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. In the first quarter, it was more of the order of magnitude of 6%, which was more a sort of proportional, you know, back of the envelope calculation. Uh, right. So I was always surprised that, the, the, you know, these, these 25 to 30% annualized growth rates seem quite optimistic, you know, then so, so that GDP only drops by 6 or 7% in a quarter. Yeah. I sort of but thought that of course, a lot of a lot of GDP is incompressible because you have you know imputed rents and you have the public sector. So uh, um, so the yeah. private sector GDP uh, uh, might collapse by much more than this, and that's actually those who are, are the tax base, right? And uh, and the true. Um, and no, exactly. Yeah, my reaction was my, my sort of back of the envelope way of thinking about it was that sort of what matters is, I mean, A, what Jesus said is the, the, the clinical uncertainty, what, what happens with the virus and just simply the duration of how long uh, lockdown would have to be, uh, which we just don't know. And then the second thing is, you know, how much activity falls over the period where you have to lock down, which, I mean, the numbers I sort of came up with were pretty large in particular in terms of a reduction in effective labor supply and some sectors just being yeah, yeah but you easily get to numbers like 15 percent in the quarter uh, and sure. yeah. yeah yeah but but when come come back to my point about difference between uh, how we define gdp in national income approach accounts and real stuff so all spanish schools are closed right now but funnily enough, Spanish NIPA is going to still consider that the Spanish school system GDP is exactly the same that in the first quarter. Exactly. The same for the French courts, because, you know, uh, uh, these, uh, these courts are closed, but these people are civil servants. Their wages are paid, presumably by ECB, you know, uh, <laughs> euros. Uh, GDP does not fall in terms of services their gdp is is exactly equal to zero right uh. so uh, can i can i add something about the we're talking about the long term uh, how how fast we're going to recover given that i'm working on these the optimal interventions what so one thing that we have to take into account is that these policies may come back and uh, i i don't think that they are going to be lifted anytime soon 
so if you if if you try to to see what is the optimal length of intervention, you find something that you should continue until uh, until September or October in some way or another. That's one thing. The other thing is, given that it's been effective, it creates these problems that epidemiology, the epidemiology is always mentioned that is the second way. You right. know, so, I, and given that there is always this looming risk of a second wave, I think they're going to continue at least until the next year when the flu season comes back, some restrictions are going to continue. In that sense, that is what I see different supposed from a war. When the war is over, it's over. In this case, it seems that you stop the interventions, but it's not really over, at least until you find a vaccination, right? And, uh, and even, even, even in that case, even the, the, they leave the restrictions, people are still scared. So you go to the restaurant, you see that it's full of people coming from Rome, that you go to generally to a bar, it's all packed with people. You don't want to enter in there. You don't want to enter to a supermarket, you don't want to do services and stuff like that. So I don't, in my view, I think it's going to continue until the last, the next year. So I don't, I don't see any soon recovery. I mean, maybe the next year is going to still, the GDP is going to be down. I don't know how much, but uh, I think it's the looming risk of the coronavirus coming back. The yeah, next okay. Year. Right. So, yeah. so there are two, two questions. There is how, how big is the shock and how long is the shock? And then, you know, how uh, how sluggish is the recovery after the shock from uh, the 2008 recession was uh, uh, the impulse was peanuts compared to now it was uh, some from interbank lending and uh, a bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers and now we have something which is huge so it's got to be longer and worse than 2008 even if things had to be uh, we start in a couple of months, which I agree is not granted at all. Okay, so let me let me qualify my answer a little bit because maybe I was not as clear as I could. By long run, I was or relatively fast. I was not saying July or August. Okay, uh, I see a lot of people talking about this lasting until 2025, and that's what I object. Oh, I, I don't think so. In that sense, and that's what I was saying. You know, it's, it's going to be September. It's going to be February that I don't think anyone knows. Do I think that we are going to be back in a relatively normal situation by 2022? I think so. 2022. Okay, so I'm, talking, I'm giving myself 18 months. Now, um, the second point I, I wanted to, to mention is, yes, if people don't go to restaurants, that's bad for restaurants, but people will do something else with their money. So for instance, something I have already seen in the US is all the good restaurants in Philadelphia suddenly do delivery, okay? And there is long, in fact, my favorite restaurant very close to where I live, they also have takeout. There's a long line for takeout every Saturday. So the economies adapt. And what we don't know is the elasticity of substitution, how is this to adapt? But if this takes a little bit longer time, people is going to come up with very creative ways to get around those problems. So I'm not saying this is going to be cost-free, but I also try to point out that market economies, if you let them be very flexible in coming up with creative ways to generate wealth. Now, Duny, how do you view this shock? What kind of shock is this? Uh, <coughs> First, I would like to say, this shock is unique, nothing to do with the crisis of 2008. It's much more like the World Trade Center attack. In other words, it's exogenous to the system, nothing to do with the trade cycle, the business cycle, technological cycle, whatever. You have a system which is doing what it can, and suddenly you are shocked. This shock is absolutely unique. The second only shock since the post-war of the First World War, it's serial. So it's continuing and continuing and continuing. It's delocalized. It's not like the World Trade Center in New York and it's around the world. It's invisible, like terrorism, but you know, everyone is affected, seems to be affected, could be affected, therefore extremely pregnant in the population as compared even to terrorism. Uh, there is no destruction of equipment. And therefore, usually when you have a shock, 
you have uh, bridges, houses, whatever, like in a war. Here, I mean, the equipment, the capital goods are absolutely intact, so it is not affecting capital goods. Maybe they are used, but certainly not uh, the capital goods themselves. And, and so, the unique since the Spanish flu, uh, I have no equivalent. Maybe as close as I could find was the World Trade Center, but it was localized, as I said, and it was visible uh, as contrary to what we see. So, so I don't believe in a V-shaped recovery, not at all. It's going to be a U-shape, it's going to be long. You have too many things uh, in the pipe to be really cleared before we go. I agree with the fact that unless we're vaccine, is going to be around and people will not go back to a normal consumer behavior or investor behavior. And so for me, we're going to recover the level of GDP per head in 2020 after a long lasting and destructive U-shaped uh, recovery. Uh, by the way, we could have adverse effects on the financial system, on the sovereign debt, on many issues, on uh, protectionism, on return of um, government uh, intervention. And therefore, yes, uh, just to summarize, it's a change of trajectory, like a collision of planets. You have orbit, and suddenly you have a collision of planets with change of trajectory. So to go back to the initial trajectory, I don't believe so. We're going to go to another trajectory after three or four years of extremely deep uh, uh, changes in the way we behave, uh, we invest, we consume, and governments act, so that's my view. Much more structural than conjectural. Okay, anybody wants to uh, react on this? Just one quick comment that I think we're forgetting, but probably we're gonna address in the next in the next uh, question is this is creating the COVID is also creating a problem in the public finances that are going to have it going to imply different policies by government that it can harm the recovery you know changes in tax policies changes in uh, in, in in some fundings that it could have another another effect so i think we are we are uh, i think we're focusing only on the on the direct effect of the COVID, but there is also indirect effect to to public finances, but I, I think we're going to talk later about it. Right, right, we are, we are going to indeed uh, talk about public finances, but before we do that, I just want to wrap up a little bit, you know, uh, the, the issues. Uh, basically, uh, we can think of this, of this uh, um, crisis as an adverse uh, temporary supply shock, uh, a bit like an oil shock uh, of the 1970s, worse maybe. Uh, but in which case it's temporary and uh, we may return to normal after a while. Uh, and then uh, uh, there are, you know, plenty of economic models that talk about nonlinearity, hysteresis, persistence, multiple equilibria. And, um, and then from this perspective, we may well, you know, fall to uh, a new long-term equilibrium, which is worse forever. This is very different from restarting European economies in 1945, where, you know, uh, basically this was an economy based on agriculture, manufacturing, you know, crafts. So you just do the same thing as before. Here there is an entire, you know, uh, economy that could, that could collapse. You could have uh, between uh, suppliers and uh, customers that are severe forever, and a lot of activities are not uh, as essential as before, right? Consulting, advertising, uh, higher education, uh, etc. And so uh, that could be a real collapse of, of a lot of, of sectors. And then, of course, going back to public finances, we can have negative feedback loops going through policy. Uh, actually, there is an old paper by Blanchard and Summers which says, you know, if things are bad, you have social insurance, you tax a lot, but then you have a lot of distortions and things are bad. So you could have, you know, multiple equilibria. And so um, uh, public finance is also a, a channel 
through which we might be locked down in a high tax, low incentives uh, trap. So let, let us move and uh, uh, talk about these public finances. Uh, so basically, these lockdowns have a, are putting a lot of strain on public finances. There is a huge collapse in tax revenue. At the same time, governments send check to people to uh, avoid uh, a social uh, catastrophe. So obviously, budget deficits and public debt is rising very fast. So what is the impact of the crisis on the long run fiscal sustainability, sustainability of, um, of Western countries, in particular in light of the euro sovereign crisis and in light of the fact that the central banks are increasingly the lender of last resorts to governments? Facundo, could you? give us some views about, about that. And so, yes, exactly. Not long ago, I started to work on that with a, with a colleague, Kirill Shantov. So what we, yeah, let me tell you quickly what we tried to do. You know, I don't know, you know, there is this paper by uh, Conesa, Kitao, and Kruger that basically compute the optimal tax system in, in, in the US. And what we do is do a, a simplified version of that to try to estimate what is the implication of a sudden increase in debt over the tax policy. And something, as you say, sort of, sort of intuitive, you need to increase revenue because you need to pay a lot of debt. But the question is what kind, what kind of taxes you increase and what kind of taxes you move? Because you also have a concern about efficiency and you have to be careful. And basically what I think the way to pay for this debt is like, is increasing capital taxation you know, it's like an increasing it a lot from the, if, if you think in, in, in you know, in, in Italy it's around 30%, maybe you should go to 40% the tax on capital and, and you have to decrease the tax on labor. Uh, why? For efficiency, you need the people to work more. Okay, so you need to increase revenues, but you need to stimulate the economy and, uh, and you need to pay the debt. And the way to do it is to decrease some distortion. The distortion to decrease the tax of labor and potentially also reducing uh, reducing uh, redistribution. So in that sense, we are considering all the possibilities that they, what, what would be the ultimate redistribution in this context and the effects can be huge. Uh, especially if we are talking normally when you think about accumulation of debts over the normal business cycle, there is no much change in debt. In many countries right now, the increase in debt is huge and you can expect a, 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 a very big impact. Uh, so, in some way, that also has negative effects because you think if you're going to increase the tax on capital, uh, on capital incomes, that could have an effect on investment. It could also, that's related to the, that we were talking before, can it have a secondary effect on the recovery of the economy? Okay, well, but soon, have, yeah. yes. No. You have to believe in the theory. I don't believe in the theory, but if you believe in the theory, you do. <laughs> capital levy, so you tax existing capital at 100% and you tell people this is never going to happen again. Uh, the capital right. exceptional uh, circumstances and we swear that capital taxation will go back to 0%. Correct. Of course, on, but no, you can do it even easier. That it goes to the other point. So if you don't need to move the taxes, you just default on the debt. Exactly. You, uh, the best yeah. way of the best way of taxing capital is to default on the debt. Right. Exactly. So if you believe, so one way out of here is you know, of this situation is either you default or you can confiscate the capital, as you say. You can do one of those. If you believe that suppose the U.S. is going to do that or Germany is going to do that, that's fine. That is the solution, and you can have a secondary financial crisis. Or the other, if you think that they are committed and they are going to pay, the, I, I, the only way that we see for that is like either increasing the tax on capital and decreasing the tax on labor, including the, the decreasing redistribution. But again, I agree with you, I'm Argentinian, and uh, you know, we're already talking about default again. You know, we haven't come out of, from the last default and they're, after the COVID, they, they got a new excuse. And I see many countries doing that. Other countries like more developed, I don't see that. I, I don't see Germany defaulting. I don't see the U.S. defaulting. I don't see Canada defaulting. I, I, I do see a lot of changes in the taxing policies in this country. Right. But, but the real issue is, will Germany default on Italian debt? That's the real question. Right? 
Germany defaulting on the Italian debt. Exactly, because they are the ones who are supposed to pay for it. For the German, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but, but that is, in short, that is my view. I think I see less redistribution, less lower, less labor taxation, and highest distortions to okay. the temporalism and savings, oh, okay. if you want to call it. And right. I don't know if somebody so, wants to add something. Right. Do we agree with this? Is it optimal? Okay, so let I mean, me even that Jesus. Yeah, so let me let me let me look at this from a slightly different perspective. So <clears throat> there is the issue first of how you actually finance yourself in the very short run. I think that most countries, at least in Western Europe, in the Western world, are not going to have a lot of problem placing their paper on the market, their treasuries on the market for the next year or so, basically because there is not a lot of good alternatives for investment. There is going to be a lot of cash around, and in that sense, you are going to be able to place your treasuries. I think that debt problems are going to start being relevant by the end of 2021. Is by that time, the economy has more or less recovered, and then we are going to look at Spain or Italy with extremely high debt to GDP ratios, and investors are going to start asking, do these countries, or more precisely, does the political economy of these countries sustain the type of long-run fiscal policies that will be able to pay down this debt? So in that sense, I'm distinguishing a little bit between, between like the next 18 months and after 18 months. What I think we need to start thinking a little bit more clearly is about the intergenerational aspect of this crisis. So we are basically shutting down the economy to save people over 60. And most of the cost of the economy, of the, of the shutting down, is being suffered by people under 50. And we need to start thinking about, given that that's the case, when we come out of this crisis, how we are going to redistribute this cost in ways that are fair. And the reason why I'm particularly concerned about it is imagine you are a 37, 38 year old person in France, in Italy or in Spain. This is the second time in your life where you are going through a gigantic crisis. And in both cases, you are the one taking nearly all the adjustment. While everyone over 60, got completely isolated from the financial crisis because they were getting retirement uh, payments. The assets, the financial assets recover is roughly the same right now in the sense that the financial assets haven't suffered that much, like what, 15, 16%. And there is a political process can just not digest having the same generation being hit again and again and again and just pretend nothing is going to happen. So that aspect of intergenerational transfers for me is absolutely key. Pan Nicolás acá. Okay, that's uh, from oh. China, I guess. <laughs> so, but so one thing. Let me add something about that. Given that I live in Italy, I know during the crisis mm -hmm. they cut on pensions. So following, uh, they cut, uh, they, they put, they put upper bounds, they decrease uh, benefits, and it's true that so that is the in some countries like in Italy, that is the biggest chunk of the spending, right? It's like it's a it's a super old country, uh, so the, uh, the 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 pensions take a lot of it. So that is another solution that probably they're gonna default on these uh, in, 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 in these uh, promises. The problem is in uh, respect to Italy and Spain, I don't know exactly how it works in Spain here, you have individual accounts. So defaulting will be actually defaulting an individual person, while in other countries you have this pay as you go, so, so sort of pay as, as you go, that doesn't allocate individual rights. So it makes it easier. But in Italy, you, you can look and basically you, you, you go into, into, your, into your account of the of the pension institute and you see how much your savings yes we which make is it, it makes it a bit more complicated to default it you know you can change the way in which they are adjusted like by inflation mm -hmm. or by gdp but uh <laughs> I, I i agree with you they should default on that but i don't know if they're gonna i think it's more likely they, they default in debt 
rather yeah. than in the old people. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand, and and, and yeah. I, I'm very worried. We are in a lot of European countries. The the, the important voting bloc is going to is going to be all people, and they are not going to let it. But yeah. coming back to your point, yes, even if you have individual accounts, I can come up with a lot of ways to redistribute this properly. For instance, a huge tax on in real estate. Most real estate is held by all people. You don't have any promise I'm not going to tax. So, you know, all these people with nice apartments in the downtown Rome, let's put a 3% tax rate on that. And you will see how we distribute income and wealth very quickly. Right. I will be Monty, Monty, Monty yes. try. Monty yes. try. Yes. Monty try and he was, he was out the next week. No, he tried exactly. He tried ex <laughs> he tried exactly that. I agree with you. They try to do that. They say we need to tax the real estate. The suppose in Italy is completely non-tax. No, 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 no. Yeah. I understand about the political okay. constraints. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. I, I just want to go back to uh, his claim that you know sovereign uh, governments, including in Europe, have um, no problem. Uh, uh, selling their debt uh, right now. Uh, do you agree with this? I mean, why, why would anybody buy this paper, uh, especially if, you know, they believe Jesus who said that one year from now it's going to be in trouble? Uh, you know, usually such a crisis, such a shock leads to incredible repricing of everything. So uh, I believe many of the prices are going to be price of risk of course is going to be revisited by investors uh, and therefore i don't believe that the world of tomorrow is going to look like the world of yesterday two two remarks first it's incredible our governments are blind uh, short-sighted uh, myopic find the right word um, some some countries enter the crisis with reserves uh, budget uh, surplus, able to pump into the system part of the reserves accumulated over time. Uh, and some countries entered this crisis with you know, already a huge amount of debt, uh, fiscal deficit, and I would say social deficit. So, so my view is that uh, the divergence between countries is going to increase uh, extremely it's really deeply, and, and I believe that Europe is going to put under an incredible amount of pressure. I'm very pessimistic about the sustainability of Europe as it goes, because when you look at the difference between the North and the South, it's, 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 it's widening at a speed which is absolutely believable. And I don't believe that cooperation and mutualization and clean resources will be uh, possible in the such circumstances. So, so international pressure, uh, certainly less altruism and more uh, egotistic uh, uh, behavior. Uh, you, we have seen that during the crisis. Look at the question of buying masks. And uh, in, in other words, uh, um, the starting point was bad and the ending point is going to be very bad. So that's, that's, that's my view. Now the usual, the usual. Sorry. Yeah, the go usual, ahead. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say I agree. The situation is bad now. From the point of view of the north of Europe, you have two options: either you mutualize one way or another, and then you you are an idiot, right? The whole euro project is a scam to deprive you of your savings by those who don't save. Uh, or you say, you know, I don't mutualize, and then the South will be exactly in the same situation as Greece. That is to say, it will have to balance the accounts overnight, and that's going to be brutal. So, can I ask a question? So, I know to the people who know better about, than me about monetary policy, isn't it this a situation in which the central bank should be like sharply fin financing the, the fiscal deficit independently of inflation. Then you say, you know, this is a shock. We have a big problem. And then the ECB or the Federal Reserve get in and they fully finance the public deficit. Isn't that an option? Why, why, why not? So we no, know that you have many instruments and you have to try to use them all. Inflation and, and printing money is one of them, right? 
I don't yes, know what is it's exactly opinion. it's exactly what the South in the European context. I mean, printing money in the European context is a tragedy of the commons because everybody <laughs> wants to bet to get the ECB's money. Um, so it's not sustainable unless you unless you you know, put fiscal policy at the European level too, which means you deprive states of their sovereignty. Yeah, but it's an aggregate shock, right? It's like you think uh, you, you print money in the US, it affects different states in different ways. Look, I, I'm not trying to make any statement, I'm just asking a question. And I, it seems to me, it seems to me like uh, it's an instrument that should be used and it should be used a lot more. I mean, I understand the central banks are started to, to do something in that way, sort of cover, but I don't know how, how deep it should be. Maybe it should be an insane in intervention. I, don't, I know as an expert in monetary policy, probably you guys know better than me, but, <laughs> but I don't know why not. <laughs> so Facundo, let me, let, me, let me tell you where I agree and when I disagree with your statement. So the part where I disagree, let me start a little bit on the negative side, is part of the constraint now is of supply, okay? So the, the way I think about it is as follows. Uh, typical crisis, we produce pencils and people go to the factory to produce pencils, but there is some type of demand shock and people don't want to buy pencils. So the central bank can give money to the government, the government goes and buys a bunch of pencils and puts them in storage. We fix the problem. That's kind of the Keynesian view of the world. Well, the problem here is we are not going to make pencils because the guy who wants to make pencils is afraid at home that he's going to get COVID. So even if you give money to the government and the government tries to buy pencils, the pencil is not being produced. So that doesn't fix anything. That's in the sense in which thinking about the economics of a war kind of makes you help you know thinking a little bit about this having said that once the economy recovers or let me put it in a better way once we can start producing pencils again i think that having a little bit of an increase in the price level may help readjust relative prices a little bit more easily than if we don't have that increase in the price level so think about a world with rigidities uh, a good thing about a 5-10% increase in the price level is that allows to readjust a lot of things which mass less pain than if we actually need to do adjustment in nominal quantities. So that's, the, that's a situation in which I will be relatively supportive of a, of a, of a more generous fiscal monetary policy. Now, this statement is much more true about the United States than about Europe exactly because of Jill's point about the common, the common pool problem. In the US, at the end of the day, the president and the administration is chosen by the whole country. Okay, so yes, there is going to be a transfer between Connecticut to Georgia, but the point is the person in Connecticut and in Georgia, they basically think about each other as cousins. The Danish or the Dutch and the Greek do not think of themselves as cousins. They think of themselves in the best case as acquaintances. And that the political economy is completely different. So uh, let me just add one thing respect to your first point, the negative. I agree with you that at the end it's a physical issue, it's a resource constraint. Yeah. But if you create inflation, you, you decrease the liabilities that the crisis is created. And that could be helpful. That's no, no. what he had in mind. That, that is what he had in mind. And instead, at the end, if there is a resource constraint, and that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, no, no. But, yeah, yeah, and that's why I was saying that an increase in the price level of 5-10% can be helpful in this situation. I, I, I believe that, you know, I've seen an incredible increase of uh, unconventional monetary measures. Uh, the uh, central bank in UK buying directly, lending directly to the government, not even buying, you know, debt, but, but really lending money to the government helicopter money in the US and so on and so on. So ECB again uh, accepting to buy uh, bonds, whatever the uh, situation of the country. So anyway, so now what I don't understand is a link between monetary supply, inflation, that seemed to be as straightforward as before, 
But my strong conviction, the end of the story is going to be a rise of inflation that will wipe out part of the debt, that will make those redistribution between categories, uh, population <coughs> categories, more implicit than explicit, as contrary to uh, any kind of fiscal policy, and that will be one way to finance uh, the shock uh, and all the measures that have been taken by, by governments. So, yes, I believe inflation is in the pipe and should appear somewhere. Uh, I don't know when, again, and that will be a radical change as compared to the last uh, 30 years. Because anti-inflation policy dates back 30 years now. Right, this makes a lot of sense, but then I cannot help thinking, you know, what will the Germans think about that? Uh, they will think that, you know, uh, they are being robbed, basically. Uh, but that's why I say, are... I agree with you, that's why I said uh, there will be such divergence between countries, uh, exchange rates, uh, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and so on and so on that I believe that uh, the international order is going to be put under incredible pressure. First and foremost, the European Union. So the Brexit is just the start of a movement that will, that will spread, uh, spread around. I mean, save your arts will be certainly the key word for the uh, months, quarters, and months ahead. Maybe we should ask Ben, since he's the official German. Yes, <laughs> I was thinking about that. <laughs> Ben? So, Ben, we, we don't hear you, but... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 you can hear me. What, <laughs> what will the Germans think of waking up in the morning and living in, a, you know, uh, under the, the yoke of an old-style Southern European uh, inflation-prone central bank? How long is this going to last? <laughs> Right. Yeah. No. I mean, it's uh, a bit hard to hard to say. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, you know politics involved in this and uh, emotions. Um, yeah. I mean, I I I, I don't want to you know speculate too much. I mean, it's, it's it's too hard to say. I mean, the the one thing I kind of wanted to actually ask the panel is sort of a little bit different, which is it comes back to the myopia. Uh, of governments that uh, Denis had mentioned, which is, I mean, fundamentally, we just don't know how long this situation will continue from the virological side, right? And so far, all these uh, policy packages, they're A, ginormous, and uh, B, I mean, they're actually relatively temporary. I think they all have some sort of, you know, expiry date of sort of three months or, or, or half a year from now. So I guess the question I wanted to ask people, you know, what on the panel, what do you actually think will happen if this goes on for like 18 months? So if there's no vaccine found uh, and, you know, we just continue having these sort of intermittent lockdowns, say, do you think, you know, governments will just keep every time there's a lockdown, keep, you know, taking out the liquidity bazooka again and support, give large transfers uh, to, to, to households and businesses? or will it sort of stop at some point? So at the beginning of the crisis, Richard Baldwin had a great column on Box EU where he highlighted the commitment or the quarantine or the lockdown uh, limits in the sense that he was basically saying, look, you can keep this for six weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, but after that, the political process will just not accept it. And I'm seeing that in the US already, the situations, the political economy of the U.S. is a little bit different, but it is very clear that even very, very democratic governors are reopening the economy, like here in Pennsylvania, just because the political pressure is too strong. And Europe over there will always come a little bit later, but I don't see the political willingness to do another eight weeks of lockdown, for instance, in Spain in the fall. People yeah. is going to say, whatever, we die, you know, shit happens in life. So that would then also suggest so that for the public finances, you know, it would maybe for now at least be mostly a temporary thing that, you know, these huge packages are more like for a three months or, or yeah. six months horizon. I don't know, but I, I, I don't no, know. No, but that, that goes also to the point that I thought we were going to discuss later, that maybe the second lockdown needs to be very different. That maybe need to be much more targeted, designed in very different ways, and in that way, much more sustainable. I just don't see 
the, the, a political process that will accept this for 18 months, not in a democracy. You can do this in Singapore, you can do this in China, you cannot do this in a democracy. No, but the one thing that probably hasn't been mentioned is like... Uh, democracy is not an eh? No, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Yes, no, no, it's like a substitute for quarantines is testing, right? So, and then you say when they did these initial lockdowns, you are a government, you have no idea, there is no way to test it, there is no technology or not availability. You may think that in the future they're going to scale, scale up the ability of testing. You know, because you can test both immunity and, and being infected or not. And that, that could be, I, I understand that in China they are doing it big time right now. It's like when you go to the factory, they do the test. If, if you have a problem, you go home. If, if you don't, you can get in. Uh, but I, and I think in the medium term, more than quarantines, I would see a lot of investment in, if there is no vaccination, a lot of investment in, in scaling up the, the possibility of testing. But I don't know what is the status of the technology right now. Right? So, but that is a... Yeah. Well, when I see the, the statistics, the death statistics, I can't help asking myself, hey, what is the social welfare function behind all this? Because still, you know, this is not huge, right? So it seems that there is a huge risk aversion. Of course, we talked about the intergenerational uh, uh, transfers implicit in all this, but uh, this risk aversion seems almost counterproductive because uh, we know that, uh, you know, if the economy, uh, first of all, there will be other viruses, right? So Denis is right uh, to say, you know, uh, at this level of risk aversion, we might have to change our life forever and live in a reduced, you know, low, low intensity economy uh, for now. Uh, but then isn't it counterproductive? Because we know that this reduction in GDP will have health consequences and nobody seems to... Uh, weigh them against the health benefits of the lockdown. Um, so this does not seem very well thought, uh, uh, thought uh, out. And uh, I would like to know what are your, view, your views about you know, what else might have been done after all. Uh, how about doing nothing? Or you know, how about uh, a libertarian solution where you tell old people, you know, uh, you know it's your business uh, to stay healthy. Why don't you just stay home? Most of you are retired. Otherwise, you bear the consequences. So let me, let me say a couple of things because I actually thought and brought a couple of things about that. Uh, I think that a key issue here was that especially at the beginning, uh, we didn't really know what was the mortality rate of the virus and that some of the early indications were that it was a little bit worse than what I think we have learned it is especially if you are under 60. And that probably induced people to take uh, actions that were maybe a little bit tougher that will have been optimal. Second, and that goes back to your point at the beginning of the, of the, of the seminar or the, of the round table, <clears throat> is that especially during the first two weeks, all the decisions were made by experts on public health. And they are very smart and they know their stuff very well. They just never think in terms of trade-offs. Because when you go to public health policy, school, this is not about trade-offs, it's about different things. And I think that a lot of governments got themselves into a rat hole because they didn't use the input of economists and other experts in areas outside health policy about the consequences for these things. So I was talking with people even here in the U.S., and in Spain, and, and you realize that a lot of the measures taken during the first week, they kind of miss just very basic facts about logistics of how you can do this, how you can handle uh, even the, the food chain uh, supply. And, you know, if you don't have food, then it's way worse than dying of, of COVID. And in that sense, I think that the next crisis that, or, the, or the next wave, hopefully governments will listen to economies a little bit more. And in particular, if we have access to testing and to tracing and other policy tools, we can design this in a much, much better way that without going all, all way libertarian can certainly reduce the aggregate cost by an order of magnitude. 
Can I just say a word on that? I remember we all James Tobin uh, paper, maybe 1952, and it was dealing with perjury. And it, 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 the message stand on this was when you, are, you start to be in state of urgency, permanent urgency, you have no rationality, no trade-offs, no, you, you are able to pay 20% if you need them for the next day. And, and all governments ended up in a state of extreme urgency. And most of the decisions were irrational. And no trade-offs in those times, you know, to save lives. One of the consequences of the crisis is the value of human life has skyrocketed in the world. So trade-offs now are with public, public makers trade-offs value life and suffering much more than they did in the past. So, so in the name of saving lives, have decided to close and lock downs with an immense cost for the entire population because they value as marginal, what I say in, in terms of quality, uh, the increase is something unacceptable. That's new. Uh, it was not the case in the past. So that's why I say the trade-offs are going to be put in different terms in the future, uh, leading governments to make decisions that are not as they did before. And most of it uh, are very far away from the optimal uh, well-being for the population. That's my view. Can I jump in? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so just briefly, um, I mean, on this, on this uh, question, whether there's a trade-off, and in particular, you know, what would have happened if we'd gone with the libertarian solution that Gilles had suggested? So, I mean, we, we actually have some work on this, and we have a little, uh, you know, theoretical model of the economy that we can use as a laboratory to do these kind of experiments, and we've done that. And... Uh, Okay, the first thing is, it's. I mean, Facundo has said this before, I don't think it's entirely obvious that there is, uh, at least in the short run, such a large trade-off between sort of the saving lives and, you know, saving the economy. And so Facundo said this before, in particular, if you sort of just let, sort of let it rip, just let the epidemic run, um, people basically uh, uh, seem to get scared and don't go to restaurants and uh, don't go to work anymore. And uh, at least in our theory that we disciplined with some data that we have so far, you get a very drastic recession, even in the do nothing scenario. Um, the only thing that's sort of good in quotation, and, and you kill a lot of people, obviously, so it's kind of a bad outcome. The only thing that's sort of good about it in, the, in, in quotation marks is that it's a very sort of a short lived uh, uh, thing, because then if you just sort of do nothing and go with the libertarian solution, you get uh, that the uh, uh, recession is over after half a year or, or nine months. Whereas with the lockdown, you have uh, kind of the, the recession you get with lockdown in the short run is basically equally bad as the one that you have uh, if, you, if, you, if you just do nothing, um, but it just lasts for longer. So the issue with the lockdown policies is really the duration, not so much like what happens in the short run. That's, that's, that's sort of how we thought about it. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I would sort of push back a bit against the idea that the libertarian solution would be so great. And the other thing I want to say on this is, I mean, the, in the nature of the problem, sort of almost the definition of the problem, uh, there is a big externality, which is that people, when they go out and do stuff, they don't take into account uh, how much they're going to affect others, or at least not as much as they should, and they only take into account how much they affect themselves. So we know that in economics, whenever there's externalities, we can do better uh, with uh, some sort of government intervention. So that, I think, already tells you that you want to do some sort of a lockdown uh, uh, just because there's this externality, and that seems to come out of uh, all economic analyses I've, I've seen of, of these optimal trade-offs. Um, so, you know, it's not clear that what we're doing right now is like, you know, the right thing. And if this goes on for a very long time, it's, the outcomes seem to be very bad. But doing nothing, I think, to me at least, is pretty clear that would have been uh, at least uh, equally bad in terms of the, the, the optimality. Yeah, yeah no, I, I fully agree with you on that, um, Ben, that doing nothing because of the externality is probably not the right idea. I was only trying to highlight that there is always a marginal utility 
of an extra measure and a marginal cost and that we probably didn't equate those two very well. And if you are asking me, should we close down rock concerts where you put 20,000 people together shouting? For sure. Should we close down big department stores with 600 people inside? Probably yes. Do we need to close down a mom and pop shop where like three people inside? I don't think this passes that. Type of so can I can I get something before? You, so let me say with respect to what Gil say at the beginning. You know, I, I was working in this the optimal intervention, mm -hmm. and the reason why exactly what we started to write in this paper is because this idea. The first thing that I thought is these these people are crazy. They are not thinking about economics. Okay, so they are not really taking into account the trade off. And one of the things that we try to do in, in our case is exactly consider different curvatures of the welfare function. And, and, and actually, is when I was surprised to find out that the more or less the policies are, the, are reasonable. If they weren't really considering the trade off, they should have done something like in Wuhan, that basically you shut down completely the town for, uh, for two months, and then it's, it's sort of over. But uh, I, I, I think even though the, the recommendations of the epidemiologists or the doctors were saying you should stop everything, I think the political system in some way internal, internalized the, the, the economic cost and they did it a lot smoother than you may have thought. You know? so, and we really pay a lot of attention about this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's exactly as Ben was saying, it's this trade-off of a sharp intervention at the beginning you know, like completely shutting down everything or doing longer for a long time when you really cost about smoothing out the cost. But, but I don't, yeah, but I don't yeah. think that the Wuhan approach is, is logistically feasible. I agree, I agree. No, no, no. no but, but let me tell you why. You are shutting down Wuhan, but the rest of China still works. Correct. You can produce rice and vegetables in the rest of China and you ship it. And, excuse me, if you do the Wuhan thing at the national level, Literally, there will be no food. So Correct. you cannot do that. Correct. I agree. Yeah, exactly. So I thought that, and that was my point before, I think that a lot of the public health officials do not fully internalize the pure feasibility issue of you need food in the store, you need electricity, you need water, you need gas. And once you have all these essential activities, then, and that's a hard constraint, and that's the type of things I haven't seen in a lot of economic models, of the hard constraints of activities that cannot be shut down on a national level. You can do it. Imagine that the, the, we have identified that the virus was only in Lyon. So we can always shut down Lyon, and we produce food in the rest of France, and we send it to Lyon. But once it's the whole of France, that's not feasible. What we have learned from this crisis on paper, it's a textbook case of governments being great. Externality, yes. health crisis, blah, blah, blah. Now we observe that they are very good at coercion. They are very good at preventing people from going to work, from meeting their friends and so forth. They are very bad at even conveying information about what they are going to do uh, in uh, March 15, we were supposed to go voting. They are very bad at organizing production of masks, of tests, of healthcare. They are just, you know, they suck at doing their job that they took over in the name of externalities. Um, and on top of that, they restore the command economy. I'm waiting two months for an internet connection. They are putting in place price controls uh, and they are doing much worse than in World War I and World War II, where at least they were able to, you know, uh, reallocate production towards weapons. But in France, they are not able to do anything except preventing people from uh, working and living. So, you know, here the theory of externalities is meets, sorry, the practice of what actual governments actually are. But I mean, some governments do a better job than others, right? I mean, so I would sure. argue, for example, my government in Germany, I, I, I think they're managing this rather okay. I, I don't have an opinion on how the French government does, <laughs> does things, but, uh, you know, there are some differences across countries. So not all governments are managing this terribly. 
But you, you have lots of you have lots of uh, concrete uh, decision to make, and those are trade-offs: testing, yes or no; confining, yes or no; tracking, yes or no; and so on, so on. So those are concrete decisions. Where when you look at Sweden on one side and France or Italy on the other side, or Germany, as you just mentioned, there are different policies. The way they are implemented, defined, and applied. And may I say, it's a test for me where uh, some governments do much better than others because they, they put the questions in a way where they assume uh, their choices. So that's what I was saying. When you are too much in a state of urgency, you are in a situation where you don't make rational choices, like, you know, who has access to hospital. It's, it's a tough decision, I do understand. At the end of the day, if you have 100 beds and you have people that are sick, how do you treat this question? And that's where I believe uh, this series of small decisions uh, taken uh, through time explains why differences in number of deaths or, or people that are sick. May I say, we should certainly uh, spend time to study the way governments have reacted around the world because we have a lot to learn and may I say, the Swedish case is for me something which is extremely impressive, may I say, as well as the German case as compared to my country or whatever. So we have to be careful about the second wave. Look at Singapore. Uh, they thought it was over. They start again. And here where social, social pressure, social tensions are going to increase. I'm quite uh, anxious about... Uh, the increase of social tensions in the months and weeks and months to come, uh, combined unemployment, fear, confinement, and whatever. And so we could have a, not a second wave, but a second wave of, of contests in certain countries uh, if we don't manage the social body in a nice way. So um, we still have a lot of issues in front of us. Uh, and I believe that we should uh, that's a role as economists, certainly send messages to governments to try to find the narrow path. It's a very narrow path. I mean, trade-offs are always narrow paths. Uh, so as to be sure to minimize the economic cost and, and try to maximize the, the long-term well-being of the population. Not that easy. Yes. So one of the very first things I brought about this crisis in early March was that this crisis was going to put on the table the idea of capabilities, state capabilities. So this is something that has grown a lot in economic history uh, over the last decade or so, since I did it too. Uh, that stuff, let me, let, me, let me mention it. And the idea is we are getting more and more convinced that economies have done well. It's not as much whether the government is very big or smaller, but it's how well they do what they are supposed to do. And uh, I highlighted in that, in that article that I was worried that many European countries had low state capabilities. So what I see in Germany versus Spain is not that the German state, the German government is larger than the Spanish government. What I see is that the German government is able to think about alternatives in meaningful ways, while the Spanish government is not. And this is, I think, goes way beyond this current crisis, has been a fundamental issue of differences within Europe over the last 20 years. And that's something that a lot of European countries really need to invest on, on building better state capabilities. So this is not having a larger state. This is not having more civil servants. This is not having more transfer programs. This is about do we have the expertise and the technical knowledge to do what we are supposed to do as a government in opposition of just having you know, 100,000 civil servants in a big office and no one has a very clear idea of what they are supposed to do. And what I see, you know, I have in, on the internet looking at interviews with a chief epidemiologist from Sweden. He talks very well. It's very clear that he's on top of things. When I talk I see on the internet interviews with a top guy in Spain. Uh, he doesn't reassure you that he's really on top of the issues. And that worries me very, very deeply.
Okay, um, maybe I would like to move on to the, the, the last question, and hopefully there will be some, some time for, for questions from the floor, although I'm not sure we can call this a floor, maybe the cloud, questions mm -hmm. from the cloud. Um, but uh, I think it's an important question. We see that a large fraction of economic activity has been transferred online. In my view, um, from a pure you know, efficiency perspective, a lot of it was overdue. A lot of people were commuting, for example, just to exchange information at the workplace, which is a sort of you know, outdated technology. So uh, my question is, does the crisis accelerate some structural change, which is inevitable? Does it um, uh, accelerate the digital transformation? And uh, do you see any other long-term uh, structural effects of the crisis? Uh, uh, I know many people worry about income inequality. Uh, will, will it be changed uh, uh, in one direction or another in a permanent way? I would like to hear your, your views about it. So maybe Ben, you could say. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's a very interesting and important question. Um, so I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, I think there's going to be some structural change uh, even that, that's going to remain even after all of this is over. And I, I would go sort of even a little bit further than saying that it's sort of just inevitable structural change where the timing has changed. I, I do think people will sort of change their habits basically um, as, a, as a result of this. I mean, so where I think, you know, we can already see this is just our own uh, profession, the economics profession. Um, you know, we used to always uh, travel a lot and give talks uh, everywhere all around the world and we've, we're all on planes a lot and, and now there's all these virtual seminars uh, popping up so I think, you know, uh, a lot of uh, talks, uh, I mean, quite often I may not want to go to San Francisco anymore just for, uh, you know, uh, two, three days uh, from London and uh, in, instead I'll just, you know, get on a Zoom call. I, th I think it's not going to completely happen, but I think a lot of this will happen a lot more. And if you then sort of factor in things like climate change, uh, I think this uh, will, will become even more urgent. In terms of um, other uh, structural changes then, uh, that if you sort of continue thinking along these lines, I think then uh, this will also definitely have considerable effects on uh, you know, income distribution and, and the distribution of economic activity across different uh, groups in the population. So uh, one thing, for example, is that some uh, occupations are, you know, much better at, at, at working from home than others. So we're, I would say, relatively good at working from home. I mean, we can sort of get on Zoom calls and so on. I mean, we're probably a little bit less productive, but not all that much. But if you think about um, other other occupations, I guess there's uh, much less of an option. So, you know, at least for the duration of the crisis, or as long as there are lockdowns and there's a, a virus going around, um, you know, I, I, I do worry a lot about differential effects on income distribution. And then one thing you see in the data is that uh, the occupations that are most economically vulnerable uh, because they cannot work from home very well, or they're in sectors that are basically shut down, like the travel sector or the restaurant sector, uh, also have the lowest liquid wealth. And so then if this goes on for a while, they're going to basically deplete all their liquid wealth. And you can imagine having long run consequences on people's well-being uh, via, you know, these balance, household balance sheet effects. In the same way, you, you could have imagine having long term effects on, on firm balance sheets. There, the question is a little bit how this is going to, you know, if we go back to normal economic activity, are there long run effects on income distribution or not? I would think, pro I mean, that's a real possibility, uh, but I mean, that's a, that's a bit more speculative, I guess. So I think, I, I've been thinking a lot about this in particular with respect to the universities. Um, my suspicion is that there are things that are going to change forever. So for instance, faculty meetings. So at least at Penn, it was a little bit thrown upon to go to a faculty meeting through Zoom. I don't think that's going to be the case anymore. So right. faculty meetings are going to be on Zoom. Well, if you are in the department, you show up, but 
you know, in the past, I would go sometimes to the department just because we have a faculty meeting. And now that people is not going to frown upon, if you don't go to the faculty meeting, you only attend through Zoom. So that I think has changed forever. Uh, with respect to teaching, what I think is we are going to go is to a system that is going to mix more classroom teaching with, uh, with recorded lectures. So I can see the following scenario. And actually, I was already thinking about doing that last year, in fact, even before the crisis. Um, you record yourself like some very basic material. You know, I imagine I want to teach, I don't know, the solo model. So I teach, I, I do it very well, and I do it once, and I record it, and it's a beautiful uh, tape uh, record of my, of my explanation of the solo model. The students will watch that. And then we will go to class and the class will be much more about questions, answers, giving you insights about what the solo model really is about. So in that sense, what I think is we are going to go much more to a mixed model. Um, with respect to seminars, I think that big departments are going to keep their seminars going on. I see this having much more on a, an effect on a small departments. You know, you are, let's say, Iowa. It's always difficult to get people to go to Iowa to give a seminar. Those may be the guys that will move much more towards online seminars. I don't see Princeton canceling their seminar series in the middle run. Now, the question is, I, I'm amazed that you think to, to, to believe, you seem to believe that our activity is going to continue uh, in terms of volume as before. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe everybody is going to go to a seminar to Princeton uh, because it's doable. Uh, and then the question is, why do we need all these people uh, who do academics? Uh, you could, we could divide by 10 and multiply by 10 the market share of the survivors. And that's it. I mean, the whole sector could unravel. And this, prob this is probably true of, of many sectors. Uh, yeah. Uh, the music industry survived uh, piracy by giving concerts. This is why, you know, the Rolling Stones are giving concerts at 80 or 85. Uh, and now, how are they going to survive if they, are, if they, you know, can protect their intellectual property online and can no longer do live events? Uh, yes. No, I know, but I, I think that education, I don't know that areas of education, but higher education has two components. One component is the pure learning and accumulation of human capital. The other one is the building of networks. And I, I was very aware of this because I taught for many years at Wharton. Even in the, the, the economics department at Penn is in the School of Art and Sciences, but I, uh, I, I was asked to teach at Wharton. And when you talk with the MBAs, it is very clear that they are not over there to learn anything in concrete. They are to build networks. They are going to learn how to deal with people in the industry, etc. And that's going to be extremely difficult to substitute by online teaching. Right, now, because the new network the new networks are going to be face group face group, sorry, but yeah. face groups and uh, whatever and no Wharton, right? I mean Yeah uh, that's that's they already what... exist. They are through LinkedIn, they are through Facebook, whatever. And we don't, we don't need Wharton, so this is obsolete, basically. And that's what I'm not so sure. I think that the type of connection that you get from personal interaction in the same room and on the internet is different. I mean, I don't know. I mean, is this is, as, as, as Ben has been emphasizing, this is a speculative. I think that the, okay. the, 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 the interaction you get from someone, uh, let, let, me, let me put it in a, in a way that is, that is probably a little more striking. Um, I, 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 I was still from the part of people that had to do the draft in Spain many, many years ago. And I did this thing, it's kind of the reserve officer program. And the people with whom I was in the academy, in the military academy, I can pick up the phone and call them right now. And they will always, always answer the phone, no matter how busy they are. People who were in college with me and didn't really go through that very kind of personal experience with me, yeah, I'm not so sure they will pick up the phone. Sure, I completely agree. But if Wharton cannot continue in person, yeah. then you're going to have to compete with oh, yeah. etc. Just like you know, we have to compete with YouTubers. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. Of amateur professors who do 
the solo model on YouTube. And yeah. they have done that for 10 years. So they are very good at this technology. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but we will adapt. I, I, I'm optimistic. I think that. I, <laughs> so, I think so that. I want to, yeah, I think yeah, that. Let's be, let's, okay, <laughs> let's be a little bit less narcissistic. So let's ask somebody who is not an academic or no longer an academic, Denis, what kind of structural changes do you see ahead? It's, 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 my life is incredible. Uh, you know, for 30 years, 40 years of social sciences, sociology, and so on, it was a theory of social interactions. And now we enter a world of social distanciation. You know, the words confinement, that it means, you know, it keeps a distance, avoid groups, avoid masses, avoid mass events, and so on. So it's, 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 a, it's a really a U-turn. For large global companies where they used to use all those uh, high-tech devices, you know, to speak around the world and to have all those types of uh, encounters and meetings without uh, presence, uh, it will change for small, small and mid-sized businesses and not so used to it. So, yes, it will certainly expand, and we will see the future uh, less, less, less meetings with people around the table. Certainly less business lunches, I regret that, by the way. Um, less, uh, less, yeah, I would say, travels to, to, meet, to meet people. So um, there will be there will be a long-lasting effect uh, because people now start to be used to it and they will go on doing it. So, uh, the, usually you have a lot of, you know, what we call the, uh, travels and entertainment, so it's a big budget uh, item uh, in any company and that will be reduced to the benefit of uh, IT devices for people wishing to, uh, to liaise. So big, 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 big change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will long lasting effect. Yeah, it will be a long lasting effect. So can, can, I, can I ask a question? Because I'm thinking, so I don't have any statement again, I just have a question. So what I take from this discussion is what the view is that some professions are going to get much better because it's speeding up some technological innovations. While uh, you think about people who are, who do personalized uh, services like restaurants, maybe they are going to be affected in the short term. But in the long term, if you think that this fear of the COVID disappears, they shouldn't be affected, right? So you will be remain only with the long-term effect on the people who are able to use this technology better. That's it, right? That, that will be like, a, in a nutshell, <laughs> the expectation. I, I would agree with that. It's difficult to get a haircut uh, through mail. Uh, it will come. But exactly. Uh, of course, I'm talking about most of the large, large firms. Everything which is conceptual, you talk about universities, uh, design, uh, lawyers, uh, go on, go on, you know, architects and so on. So lots of professions don't, you yeah. don't need, you exactly. need maybe to meet one, once, a, once, a, once a week or to, once every two weeks, certainly not permanently. The concept of officers, uh, said by the way, rather recent in history, uh, 100, 150 years, and so the 100 years for most of us uh, is going to be uh, absolutely re open space. To take an example. Uh, we all move to open space in, in companies, you know, and now we are building again. <laughs> no, open space is very dangerous. Uh, people want individual individual offices again, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, flex, flex, flex activity where you use a, the the office of someone else, you know, and, and people don't want, they want their office again to, and they don't want to share. It's, 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 it's quite a change. I, I see that in my own company, and I believe it's going to affect many companies around the world. So the way we're going to manage people is going to be different. A student of mine, sorry, a student sorry. of mine has just finished a paper where he argues that if perhaps instead of having to go to the office for five days a week, you only need to go once a week. So let's suppose you can telecommute 
and you only need to go to your office once a week, which is the day where you really need to do the interaction that there is no easy to substitute. Um, his, his view is that this may have a large effect on how we organize cities. So maybe you can live in a beautiful place in Normandy and then just take the train to go to Paris for one day a week instead of you know pay, paying a homongous rent for living in downtown Paris. Especially if, in addition to it, things like restaurants or bars are not that nice as before because of the crisis. So we may see a big change in, in urban landscape. Should we, shouldn't we expect a crash in a commercial real estate? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that I think that that's commercial real estate in the US over the last three years was crashing everywhere, basically because more and more people were used, were, were really, really getting used to get absolutely everything on the internet. And even in the most prosperous areas of the US, strip malls, which are these relatively low level quality malls, were already having a terrible time. They, they could not feel, even in a booming economy like it was the US last year, a lot of strip malls were going bankrupt because no one wanted to open shops. So I think this is going to make this even more striking. I mean, also all these, uh, you know, uh, business buildings, uh, the downtowns, yes. all these offices yeah. are going to be uh, useless. So uh, either you convert it uh, into uh, housing yeah. or you run the risk of a Detroit syndrome, right? Yes, yes, I, 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 I fully agree. And so let me give you another example. Um, I don't know if many people have this in France already or not, but at least here in Philadelphia, what works very well are the personal shoppers. So you go to Whole Foods or to other fancy supermarket and you can order everything. And there is one person that gets the order and then they deliver it to you. So these days, that's the way I'm doing it. And in the past, I was not doing it because there was a little bit of a fixed cost for me to learn the system. Does this work well? Am I satisfied with the service? Let me tell you, I love it. It's great. I wake up in the morning, I order everything I want. Three hours later, it's in my door. Even if you know COVID completely disappears from Earth, I'm going to continue doing groceries like this. Why in the world do I want to go to the supermarket? I don't know. Maybe some of you like it. I don't. Or at least I will go to the supermarket like only half of the times I used to go. So supermarkets are going to react and they are going to say, instead of having a supermarket in a fancy part of town so the rich people can come and buy over here, if they are going to do their groceries online anyway, we may as well put the supermarket 20 kilometers to the north and the personal shoppers, what do they care about going there or going to some other place? Okay, let me just... Uh, give a chance to the cloud or the floor to, to intervene. Does somebody has a question or a comment? Uh, sorry. Yes? I want to ask what do you think of the effect uh, on the international trade and also that, that this is the validation of the on the globalization? I couldn't understand anything, unfortunately. Uh, sorry. Um, I will try later, okay? Bad connection. Yes, I could not hear anything. Uh, so we see the bit of the new of the new world now. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody else? Uh, can... Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yes, and yes. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, thanks. Uh, so it's about the the, the debate you, you were having on uh, structural change. Uh, so we used to say that uh, the development in uh, services and especially uh, services to, to businesses um, is, uh, needs some face-to-face -face, face meetings and therefore big cities like London or maybe, maybe Paris are good at that. Uh, Denis is an example of that. Um, because uh, you can bring uh, many people together and you have these in, uh, interactions and face-to-face -face interactions. Whereas in small, smaller places, it's much more difficult. And we see that uh, the industry is located in smaller places, whereas services are more developed in uh, big cities. 
So then, if this face-to-face -face thing is gone, you are saying that, well, let's do everything on Zoom, then big cities no long, are no longer uh, useful. So you may see something as what uh, um, Jesus was uh, uh, describing, where you live in Normandy and you go to the big city just once a week. But you have another scenario where actually you outsource in other countries. And this is the uh, Robert Baldwin uh, book about uh, general teleworking. So you don't mind whether you work with someone in India or in South America or whatever. Do you think this is something that could happen? Uh, so, which would be a, a quite unexpected outcome of the crisis, that would be a new wave of globalization instead of a relocation. Yeah, no, that that's 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 a very intriguing thing. I I, I haven't thought about it, but you may you may be one hundred percent right. Um, the reason I was suggesting that I live in Normandy and I go to Paris once a week is because I think there is going to be a still a few interactions that cannot be easily substituted. So uh, if I think about the meetings I have at the university, uh, and again, the, the university, well, but I do a little bit of consulting with the business world. So in some sense, I have a little bit of an view of how this works. So I will say that around 50% of the meetings are very easy to substitute online there may be another 50 that are a little bit harder. So in that sense, if Penn, imagine the following scenario. If Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, were going to tell me I only need to be once a week at the university, I will move. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I will put my house on the market in three months as soon as the real estate market restarts and I will move to a different part of, of to a different city. Um, not necessarily in equilibrium. Yes, yes, yes. yes equilibrium, yes. Uh, Philadelphia may become very cheap. and uh, Yes. Or no, no, it may I, become I was like talking... countryside. Yeah, 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 no, so, I know, I know. Yeah. Could, we, could we also discuss uh, activities that are not university-based? Uh, yeah. No, like, no, I know. I know yeah, about finance, it. insurance, uh, all yeah. these services, architecture, whatever. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I, I'm going to, and, and, and so let me give you a concrete example. So Philadelphia was growing a lot over the last five years in the following scenario. A lot of people get priced out of New York. New York is too expensive. And they are, for instance, advertisement, IT, uh, marketing, etc. And what a lot of young professionals were doing was moving to Philadelphia. So they still had access to restaurants and to a lot of urban amenities. And they will only go to New York once a week. I can see that accelerating. And that's exactly Jill's point about changes in prices. And then, of course, who knows? Maybe Manhattan gets cheaper, so you don't need to do it. And there is, there is a lot of feedbacks uh, opening. Uh, but my, my view is that a lot of businesses, professional services, lawyers, accountants, consultants, etc., can reduce a lot their face-to-face -face interactions, but it will be difficult to reduce them to zero. And that's going to really open the door to a lot of unknowns about how this is going to sort it out in equilibrium. And also the other thing is people will still like the amenities. So, um, People really like, one of the reasons I think that London and Paris did so well over the last 10, 15 years on New York is because people really like to go out to a restaurant and have a nice meal and go to a bar and have fun. And, um, you know, if eventually the, 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 the medical crisis is, is subsides, people will still love to go to restaurants. Um, and that, that's going to be hard to, to substitute away. So that, in that sense, I, this is just a speculative about the kind of many different directions in which things can go. Guys, just one comment. I had to leave. I have another commitment at CPM talking about structural transformation. So I, have a, I had to be somewhere else in another continent at 6 p.m. So very nice to talk to you. Thank you very much for the invitation and see you around. If it's not in Zoom, maybe one of these years face to face. <laughs> okay, see you. Bye bye. Anyway, so. Hello. Yeah, so Jill is asking us to say something about the environment. I think that 
Ben already mentioned that this may helpful for climate change. If we live in societies where uh, you need to commute less. Uh, on the other hand, if people want to have more space in their houses, that can also be counterproductive because we'll need more heat and electricity to, to heat them out, to cool them down. But uh, by and large, my suspicion is that um, this may help. I will also say that this may be an argument to tell people, look, you need to take climate change seriously in the sense that, look, um, the, the non-linear aspects of climate change can kick, can kick in quickly in the way that the crisis, the COVID crisis kick in quickly non-linearly. So you may want to be a little bit more cautious. So you don't need to react, uh, as Denis was mentioning before, in, a, in an urgent way, but you, you have like 10 years to think a little bit carefully about this. I'm still not sure why I, I should care about climate change, especially if I'm locked at home. You know. <laughs> you know, it's already supposed to kick in 100 years from now when I'm dead. Yeah, yeah. but I, I still go for a walk. Okay to yeah. destroy the economy and uh, leave a huge debt uh, to these future generations. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be second order compared to climate change, but I'm not sure I, I, I buy that. The most stupid thing I heard in the media was that, look, you know, the lockdown is great because you can see the Himalaya 200 kilometers from there. But I'm not allowed to go there at all. So <laughs> the Himalaya is as relevant to me as a mountain on Mars. Yeah. Uh, that's completely okay. relevant if I cannot go there, right? Uh, okay, that, that's uh, fair enough, but let me... Let me, let me give you this counter argument. So something I have really noticed because of lower traffic and lower airplane is the enormous amount of acoustic pollution that we suffer in big cities. And you can really tell that life is along, at least along that dimension is more pleasant. And of course, there are always trade-offs. Okay, So I'm not going to say that the optimal amount of acoustic pollution is zero. You don't have acoustic pollution, but you get out of, of your home and you see a post-apocalyptic dystopia, yeah. like in uh, you know, the, the worst dystopian movies of the, of the past, and this presumably has a psychological damage. Yes, yes. No, no, I, I, on that I, I, I fully agree with you, Gilles. I was just trying to point out Maybe now that we have experienced what are cities with lower level of acoustic pollution, we can sit down and think, should we change at the margin the level of acoustic pollution that we have? And I think that's, that's, a, that's a meaningful conversation. May I just say a word on the question about uh, is, is you know, what's going on going to change the international division of labor? I believe so. I really believe that everything is revisited, the localization of activities, strategic, strategic investments, I would say also the political risk of appearing here or there. And so the technology combined with the fear of travels, concentration and so on, so on will lead to a new a new type of division of labor, especially intellectual division of labor. Uh, so Jesus uh, cited the university is going to extend to lots, lots of activities where we will reagent things uh, as compared to the past uh, to use talents around the world in a different way. Now the technology of uh, telecommunication has also greatly improved. Look at what we do today. It was impossible to do that 10 years ago. High speed, uh, high... Uh, the sound of extreme high quality, uh, extremely good images, uh, simplicity of use. It's extraordinary how it has evolved over time. So uh, we see many, 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 many insurance companies or banks today uh, progressing in this in this in this domain. So that that will radical change for me. I thought I would just ask a quick question on the, since we're talking about structural change. Um, yeah, there's really lots of ways you can go with here, climate change and all, and um, the environmental impacts of the of structural change. But I thought I would ask, since uh, it was mentioned earlier about um, the disparities between countries widening, um, if we have more 
uh, crises, maybe a new strain of viruses. I mean, it was mentioned earlier that this will happen again, and uh, not even maybe from virus. Maybe there'll, there'll be um, other sorts of um, uh, crises. But uh, since contracts, like the employment has been changing over a, a long time or, um, already now. Uh, the, the, the types of contracts have changed, so there are less um, full, like the traditional worker. There's less like a full-time contracted workers, and then there's a kind of a, a, have been a growth in the uh, you could call gig economy. Um, there's more temporary contracts now. Um, think of Uber Eats gig work. Um, so I guess my I I would get uh, someone's impression. Um, I'm asking for someone's impression on like is the structural change um, that will be strengthened by this crisis? Is it going to strengthen inequality? And will that um, call for a need for new types of solutions to um, alleviate? This inequality um, in the la um, in the labor force. Um, is there, there will there be differences between the U.S. and the EU? The U.S. is uh, there, there's less there's perhaps a more flexible labor market. So um, <clears throat> the solutions there might look different. Maybe a cash transfer would be more um, would, would work better in the U.S. And then there'll be different solutions in the EU. Uh, Jesus, I think you you living in the the U.S. You might be able to talk a little bit about that. So something something I have argued in several occasions is that welfare state in most Western countries is designed from the for the economy of the 1950s. So you have workers that go to a factory, the factory gets uh, less demand for six months because we have a financial crisis and we provide them with unemployment insurance. And then when they are 65, we give them social security benefits. And in the meantime, we give them also some health benefits. And that welfare state is not very well designed for the current economy. Where you, say you have these geek jobs. We have this type of structural change that no one is really knowing where it's going. We have a lot of polarization. And I think, at least in my perspective, that a a huge effort over the next 10 years to sit down and think about a welfare state for the 21st century. Exactly how that is going to be, I haven't made that much progress myself in coming up with, with sharp details. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical. I had a student that went to the market just a couple of years, a couple of months ago, working on the universal basic income. I have reasons to be a little bit skeptical about a UBI. Uh, I think that programs that emphasize more some type of job warranty may work a little bit better. Um, what I'm a little bit worried in comparison between US and Europe is that in the US they are firing a lot of people right now, unemployment is spiking, but people in some sense is also saying, look, I need to readapt myself to the new situation and be creative. And I was mentioning before the big increase in personal shoppers. I'm a little bit afraid that in Europe by shielding people too much. And again, it's not that I don't want to shield them, but I, I, I mean, this is at the margin. By shielding people a little bit too much, we may also slow down the structural transformation about uh, towards a little bit more of a long-run solution to, to some of these, of those issues. So you want to, the US may be doing it a little bit too much, uh, Europe may be doing a little bit too little. So I'm a little bit more well, in the combination. Indeed, indeed, in France, people say there are shortages in agriculture, yeah. also health and at the same time everybody was promised job security you know uh, part-time uh, unemployment benefits uh, subsidized obviously big companies got uh, instructions to not lay off too many people so this yeah. is a very um, this is a very important issue uh, it's not clear who is right uh, if you believe that this is you know, a v-shaped a v crisis then the French are right. The U.S. are stupid because uh, they are going to uh, have a, a massive spike in unemployment. And then they are going, guess what? They are going to uh, deal with this with uh, Keynesian policies and have another increase in public debt. And they are going to put a strain on their public finances. But if you believe this is structural, if you believe the new world is different from the old world, then we are wrong because we are paying people to keep their old world jobs and we are preventing the reallocation of the economy towards the new jobs right yes yes exactly. and that was a little bit what i was mentioning before is as, as denise is saying if, if we are going to organize insurance and banking and consulting jobs in different ways 
and we are not going to have offices or at least that many offices, well, the people who clean those offices will not exist anymore. Uh, and I know that if you are a person who cleans offices telling you that you don't have your job anymore is a hard thing to say, but what are we going to do? So eventually this person needs to move from cleaning up offices into doing something else. And, and, I mean, and I, yeah, and, and we can do it in a way that is that tries to smooth the pain, but, but at the end of the day, it needs to be done. The French government gave, I don't know how many billions to Air France, you know, that's cari a caricature. Uh, right? Uh, they should shrink Air France. They should pay for shrinking Air France, not to maintain it. No? Mm -hmm. Denis, any views on that? <clears throat> well, you know, when I see the amount of money which is put into uh, saving companies that are, should never be saved or should be highly transformed, um, I fear a little bit the traditional government intervention approach where, as I said, uh, under urgency, uh, they, 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 they do things that sh they should never do or they should do differently. In the case of Air France, I don't care about them financing Air France, but they should absolutely obtain from Air France a radical change of the way Air France operates, uh, is managed, is teamed, is developing, is serving people. So, so today, no one thinks about that. It's just to save companies as they are. This is true for automobile factories. I also will agree absolutely Again, the fact that you know government you know finances or no, I mean it's it's a company making cars. I mean so the traditional cars, most of them, and so unless there is a clear adaptation plan, I believe to to save companies just to save companies and jobs is not the right way to do it. So and still Schumpeterian, and those types of crises are useful if they serve to. Uh, adapt, change, close, uh, structure reforms, and so on, so on. So that's why I'm a little bit skeptical, because uh, today that's not the way we go around the world. Okay, so thank you everybody. I think we have two panelists who have left. We have 15 minutes after schedule, so that was uh, very nice. Thank you all for coming and participating, uh, especially to Denis for, uh, we, we must be very busy these days to put some time to... And, and, pay, and paying for the crisis, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> must not thank you. Much. Very good, Th thank you. Yes. Okay. Lovely, thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>